talk about hacking physical access systems today instead. So, sorry, this is your out. If you want to exit stage left over there, that's fine. I won't take it personal. Okay, so, really quick, um, since I've hijacked this uh, entire session, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about me so that you know who I am. Uh, so, my name's Valerie, for those of you who don't know me. Uh, originally from this area, so I know, like, seen a lot of former coworkers and associates here, so uh, it's nice to be back in town for a little while. Uh, so, I'm a, an executive consultant with a company called SecureCon. Some of you may have heard of us, uh, Connie Matthews, the leader of all great things with this conference, is one of our sales representatives. So if you start seeing the logo a lot, it's Think Connie. Uh, so we do a lot of cool things at SecureCon as a whole. So we're, we're kind of split into thirds. So we have uh, commercial sector, uh, where I work, and then we've got uh, federal space. And those guys do a lot of um, federal certification, accreditation, and support contracts, some staff augmentation. Uh, and then we have the other third of the company, which is like the folks that like work at certain places that don't have windows, and I don't know who they are. But I think I've chosen the best of the three. Uh, so the commercial team, we do a whole lot of critical infrastructure, uh, insurance, banking, uh, a little bit of healthcare that's starting to blend in a little more. So I spend a lot of time in a lot of different environments. So some weeks I'm trampling through a substation, other weeks I'm in a regular office building, other weeks it's something completely different. Uh, so we do a lot of the, the standard network, vulnerability assessment, penetration testing, and wireless and stuff like that, and that's all well and good. Uh, we also do a lot of device assessments for more of the, the SCADA side, a little medical. Uh, and we really started kind of finding our niche with physical access a handful of years ago. And that was more out of client need than corporate push. So it kind of evolved organically, which is fantastic. Um, I have an IT background, I have a security background, not a physical security background. So in a little while, we'll talk about why that, why that matters um, and, and the difference between the two. So I am definitely what you would call a physical access enthusiast, not a physical access specialist. Um, everything that I've learned has been on-the-job training. Big fan of the School of Hard Knocks. Uh, and a lot of it is more of just working with our clients and figuring out you know, what it is their problems are, whether they know it or not. So what you're going to see in this presentation is more of a sum of the research and the experience that we've gathered here at SecureCon um, by helping our clients and doing our own physical access lab. So a lot of it, you know, I'm going to try to put it in IT terms, um, but some of it isn't. So I'll, I'll do my best to, to do some neutral language. So why this talk? Um, physical access stuff is, is kind of all over. So I wanted to put something together that really kind of pulls it all in so that we can look at it as a whole and decide well, how we should approach this as an industry. Uh, we'll talk about some of the topology and why it's insecure. It's a big thing. Uh, and some of the attack surfaces. And then we'll put it all together so you can see one of the attacks uh, from its inception all the way through completion. So physical access systems, like, like what is this exactly? Um, a lot of different terms. This is the one that I've found is the most accurate. I'm not going to read it to you. You, you can read yourself. Um, but really, we're just trying to make sure that we're granting or denying access to the appropriate folks. So in IT terms, it's kind of like firewall, right? Uh, yeah, we stop the people that don't belong and we allow those who have access through. But why? Um, they're everywhere. So once you start looking at this a little bit and you understand what to look for in the components of these systems, you're going to start seeing them pop up everywhere. Um, from the DC area, so the metro system, the trains, a lot of that going on in there. Uh, airports, a lot of, lot of interesting stuff in airports. Um, schools, actually. Uh, my daughter's elementary school uses a fairly insufficient um, physical access deployment. And really, once you start to, to see them, you'll start to be able to pick out some of their vulnerabilities just by looking at the equipment that's on the wall. So that's where, that's where we're trying to get today. 
So what are these components that I speak of? So in physical access world, um, the access control point is kind of the, the center of things. And, and that's really where we get to the gatekeeper, more or less. So that's either literally a turnstile or a parking gate or some kind of door um, with various locks. We've got the credential reader. That's what these little boxes are. Some of them are very fancy, some of them are not. Uh, the ones that you see in the photos here, these are more legacy systems, and we'll talk a little bit about what that is and, and what that means. Then we have the credential itself. So whenever we think physical access, usually the first thing that comes to mind is card. But there are a lot of other different credentials that can be used. Uh, some of the, like the gyms and small offices, use the key tags, the little key fobs. Uh, same technology, just a different vehicle for them. Uh, other technologies, they don't really use a credential at all. Sometimes they just walk up to this pin pad and just put in a six to eight digit code, and that is their credential. I don't think that's a good credential, but that is their credential nonetheless. And then you've got some biometric stuff that's thrown in there as well. Key tags look like that, we don't have any. I did not bring my clear ones with me today. Normally I bring them so you can kind of see what's inside. So they do have small chips inside. So these cards are not the same as the chip and pin credit cards. So the stuff that we're gonna learn today uh, does not apply to credit card technology. We're not hacking anybody's credit card. That's a different session. Um, this one is solely for the purpose of physical access. So they have small chips in here, and depending on the technology, sometimes there are one and sometimes there are two. The low frequency is really what you're gonna see out there most of the time. We call it legacy, but really it's 80% of the market now. So low frequency, what, what does that mean to us exactly? Um, that means that because the data moves so slow, we can't put a whole lot of data on there, which means that we can't put a whole lot of features into that system. The higher frequency cards have started to gain popularity over the past few years, and they have some neat features that you can load onto that. So, you know, 13.56 megahertz is a lot faster than 125 kilohertz. And that matters because that changes the amount of data that we can send and the rate that we can send it. So, just like on the network side, when latency is, is very important to us, um, latency on a physical access system is almost catastrophic, it's, it's unacceptable. Um, and, and you'll see in some of the designs why. So while it doesn't seem like very long, you would have to wait from the time you present your credential and it beeps to when it makes its decision. You know, usually you're, you're talking a couple of seconds, but if you start to add more things like encryption and uh, personal identifiers on top of the stuff that's already on that legacy card, it's gonna start taking longer. And when you have large environments, like some of the office buildings around here downtown, and you have to move thousands of people in and out, that's gonna stack up your queue really quickly. So that's one of the challenges with physical access, is you have to move a very large amount of people in a very efficient way. So the high frequency cards are really good for that purpose. Um, you can encrypt them to some point. Uh, and you can put a whole lot of other stuff on there that really helps put some multi-factor into the access. Not the end all be all, but it's a step in the right direction. So if we look at this from the wavelength perspective, and it, it kind of makes a little bit more sense when you look at it this way. So if you look at the top there, that, that's our low frequency, that's our key tag or our legacy card. Uh, and our, our card number here is um, 34281, and our facility code is 12. So you can see how it rides the waves there, um, how it sends its facility code first and then its card number. Uh, facility code is gonna be usually the same for the organization as a whole, and then the card number is what makes you you, that makes you unique. Uh, but when you send that very slowly, again, you don't really have a lot of room for multiple layers or even multi-factor authentication because it just takes too long. But if you look on the bottom with our high frequency, you know, we have a lot more options there. We sent that same amount of data in just a very, very short amount of time. So the way that the um, card is encoded kind of varies by vendor. And because we're more of a, 
IT security, we, we automatically think that things are just for security. But in the physical access world, you'll see that uh, how the, the numbers are different on the card. And it's, they call that formatting strings. They're usually unique to each vendor, not because of security, but so that that vendor can lock you into only purchasing cards and key fobs from them. So it's security by obscurity, which we all know never ends well. Uh, but it's really just so that they can, they can lock you in and sell you more things. So all these little bits and bytes uh, travel along the wire to what we call an access control panel. And it's small little onboard computer, not very big, uh, but it's really kind of our, our gatekeeper in this sense. It gets its information from an access control server, right? Client server, kind of like IT. Um, the access control server is really, really the brain there, and it usually has um, an associated database sometimes on the same machine because it's not really set up by an IT person. It's usually set up by a contractor um, who may not know that that's a bad thing to do. Uh, and that, that's basically how, when you see your security folks in there clicking around and adding new people to the system and uploading pictures, they're using the access control software that's on the server. And that's really where everybody's identity within the system lives. So the basic way that this works uh, is you roll up to that reader there, you present your credential, your card, your key fob, whatever that's going to be. And that little pipe there that says WGAND output, so this is actually serial. This is right on the copper. So this is not TCP IP. Uh, the reader is literally wired directly to the controller uh, via copper. And it sends its output um, literally just a, a ones and zeros uh, in a very simple protocol, protocol called WIGAND. Uh, it's the industry standard because it's very interoperable. Uh, it's also very vulnerable, which we're going to talk about in a few slides. So when it sends that data to the controller, the controller is really what's making that decision. So on the controller, it's got a cached, basically, database of the access lists. So if I present my credential to this reader to a door that I don't have access to, uh, the reader is going to query the controller, and the controller is going to say, no, she's not on this list. It'll flash red and make that really rude beep. Um, so it, it's our gatekeeper. And then you see the Ethernet connection between it and the server. Uh, but, but that's not used very often. So when you present your card, it's not calling all the way back to the server to see if your card is still valid in the system. It's only calling to the controller, which has that cached. And depending on their preference, uh, these update between the controller and the server, sometimes that only happens once a night. Um, they don't really like to do it in the middle of the day because it's pushing a, a large amount of data to the controller. And the controller, again, is not, not a very sophisticated computer. Uh, it's just a very small board. Um, so it can't handle a lot of traffic all at once, especially on the TCP IP side. Uh, so you know, if you revoke somebody's access and you don't instantly update all of your controllers, that card is still going to work until the next sync. So this is basically how it looks on its, its architecture there. Um, we covered most of these. Uh, the exit button, we, we call this a request to exit. And some doors have them and some don't. And basically what that is, when you get close to the door, sometimes it's a button, sometimes it's a motion detector. Uh, that signals the door contact there at the top, that magnet to release so that the door can open. Once you start tiering these, it gets a little complicated. Um, some of the controllers, if you buy some of the expansion boards, you're only talking maybe they can handle 10 to 15 different doors. So usually you have a, a large cluster of these uh, scattered throughout the environment. Uh, some uh, companies like to do them by floor. You know, the third floor has its own controller, the fourth floor has its own controller. Uh, and others, it, it lumps together because they're a smaller environment and the wiring just works out right. So the other thing to keep in mind is uh, these clusters are also kind of limited on how far apart they can be by the length of the copper wire to connect the reader to the controller. So that there's a, a limit. It's usually about 500 feet, uh, which is why you'll, you'll see so many of these scattered in an environment that may not be as physically large as you would expect. 
So even if it's a medium-sized building, there may be multiple controllers there, um, just because of the fact of how the wiring lies uh, in the closet. The split personality of security, this is a borrowed slide from my awesome boss, who's not going to be mad that I borrowed it. Um, so we've got computer security folks, and we've got physical security folks. And we protect the same stuff, right? At the end of the day, we're protecting what's in the server room. We're protecting the data that resides there. We're protecting the individuals and their information uh, of our customers and our employees. But the computer security folks kind of get on their little pedestal because they're really smart people. Uh, if somebody tells you that they, they have a job in physical security, you kind of get the, oh, well, I'm sure you'll get a better job someday. Like, I'm sure it'll get better. It's okay. Um, and, and the controls are mostly designed by um, a, a, an electrical contractor, kind of like a, a Siemens. I don't remember what the local one is here. Um, but most of the time they come in, they wire this stuff up, scan the cards, the door opens, they're done. So they don't really look into things like architecture and network design um, because they, they don't need to. So that split personality really creates a gap between the two, not just technologies, but between the two groups as a whole. And physical access systems are starting to rely more and more on network components and um, smart IDs and smart devices but the folks that, that are responsible for it on the physical side don't really understand this technology. So all they know is that the computer people set that up and it works, which is a problem um, because the computer people who set it up may not necessarily understand physical security. And we see a lot of that. Uh, a prime example is uh, just architecture in general when it comes to a network a lot of times we'll come into a client site and I'm doing a, an internal vulnerability assessment on them. Like we're not even really looking at physical access, but I'll start to find door controllers um, on the ethernet because they, they have to cross between both worlds, right? Um, and they're, they're wide open to the entire network. So when we bring it up in the out brief, you know, they'll go get the physical security guy and he comes down and he says, no, you know, they're, they're on their own VLAN. Like, well, they're on their own VLAN, but that's a routable VLAN. Like, anybody on the network can touch that. So the physical guy is like, but they're on their own VLAN. I told the network guy I need that. So then they go get the network guy, and the network guy is like, hey, you didn't say anything about ACLs on that VLAN. You just said you needed a VLAN. And the physical guy is like, what are ACLs? So us in information security kind of kind of need to work to, to close that gap a little bit. And these systems don't get installed or updated very often. So your, your lifespan for a physical access system is usually 15 years, 10 to 15. Um, they cost millions and millions of dollars. They're difficult to upgrade. They're difficult to install. Uh, it's not like patching a Windows box. It takes a significant amount of time to upgrade these devices. So they don't really get the same refresh cycle that we're used to. They don't really get security patches like we do. Um, you know, we're used to rolling updates and Patch Tuesday and, and all of that stuff and hot fixes. Um, but once it's deployed in the physical access world, like that, that's it. It works, nobody touch it. So this creates a, a whole lot of problems uh, culturally as well. Because when we start to talk about changes that need to be made, uh, then it's, well, wait a minute. We, we haven't changed anything. We don't, we're not going to change it. We don't want to. We don't want it to break. So we really need to get involved as information security professionals kind of in the process before that starts. Um, and I'm working on some, some ways to do that. The other problem with the physical security industry as a whole is they rely on the technology of the network, but they don't understand it. Uh, they also don't understand things like encryption. Um, so HID is one of the largest manufacturers of um, access control systems in the world. Most of your badges probably have a, an HID logo on the back of them. Don't look now. Um, so they decided a while back that they, they were going to get ahead of the game and they were going to encrypt their cards. And it was going to be revolutionary and they were going to be able to sell a lot of them. Um, it'd be FIPS 140 compliant, so they could get on the GSA register and, and all of that. And it would be very secure, and they'd charge a whole lot of money for it. 
But they decided to roll their own crypto. Instead of bringing in folks that understand cryptography, they just used whatever the folks that worked there thought was best, um, not cryptographers. So I don't know of any story where somebody has rolled their own cryptography that ends well. So if you have one, please tell me later, because I'm really interested in hearing it. So they signed all of these readers. They put certificate on the reader, certificate on the card, credential, and they signed it. Um, but they signed it all with the same private key. Everywhere. We in uh, IT know that's bad, but they didn't know that was bad. Um, they thought nobody will ever bother it, nobody will ever crack it. Well, somebody extracted that private key from a reader a handful of years ago and published it. It caused a lot of problems. I cannot take credit for this slide. I borrowed the slide with permission because it, it was just awesome. Uh, so, so we have some problems, um, and most of the organizations that have already deployed these systems, they can't really re-key them with new certificates um, cheaply. Uh, the vendor would have to literally come in and pull all of the card readers off of the wall and physically alter the key that's on them. And for a small building, that, that might be possible, but for larger organizations that have campuses all over the country or all over the world, that's just really not possible. So they're kind of stuck with it until they upgrade. And trying to put some remediation in place to prevent that, that cloning from being possible um, is proving pretty difficult. We already talked about culture some. Uh, very very vendor loyal. That, that's the thing that um, I think takes the most understanding. They, they trust their vendor um, a lot because they only really deal with that vendor. So. In some of the instances, we found some insecure deployments, uh, some open web servers and config tools, and we recommended that they disable those features. So when they review it and the vendor comes in, the vendor says, oh, that can't be disabled, you know, can't be done. So I looked at the manual, the little RTFM, and we point to the page and the paragraph where it says, this is how you disable this web service. If you're not going to disable it, at least put a password on it. The vendor says, we won't support it if you change anything. So then they kind of let their vendor bully them because they're so reliant that they, they're afraid to say no. So let's talk a little bit about attack surfaces. So I know card attacks get a lot of attention and they're very useful. Um, I use them a lot uh, in our red team activity. But there are a lot of other attack surfaces that are out there. So we'll talk about cards a little bit, just so you get kind of like the quick overview of what they are and how it works and why it's bad. Um, but we'll move on to some of the other stuff that really kind of ties the system in as a whole. How many of you know the Proxmark 3? Couple, okay. There's some hands out there. So the Proxmark 3 is supposed to be a research tool for RFID analysis. Um, but you can buy them at DEF CON, so you can kind of draw your own conclusions there. It's very small, it's about the size of a solid state drive, um, but, but that doesn't have any power or antennas with it. So when we were using this early on in the field during red teams, um, it was very like clunky, like it's not portable. You've gotta get a battery pack for it, you've gotta get the antenna. Uh, some of the guys will put that in their pocket and run those cables down their arm and put the antenna in their hand so when they get close to somebody's car they can just like kind of put their hand out there and not be as creepy. Um, but my arms are short and I, I just I could not make that work. So I started with a couple of different ideas. Uh, this is my RFID binder of doom. Um, that poor binder will never be the same. So went to Staples, bought a very nice looking binder, gutted the inside, put some Velcro on here. Uh, so it, it mounts the Proxmark, and that little battery pack up there is just one of those little like cell phone charging packs. It's, it's nothing fancy. Uh, and then routed the cable over to the other side so that it holds the antenna. The other problem with this is those those um, connections are very loose. Like they're very very sensitive. So you can have everything plugged in, and you can get your read, and then you push the button again to replay that data, and it doesn't replay. So then you're standing there by the card reader waving this bag and nothing's happening. So you kind of have to, to go with the flow. 
so, so that didn't really work as well. I needed something that would hold everything in place, but not, I didn't, I didn't want to glue anything. So next came the Grid-It. I love the Grid-It. You can get these at Micro Center. It's really designed for like keeping all of your cables and all of the Mac adapters that us Mac people need um, for regular operation. Uh, but it works fantastic for the Proxmark. It holds everything in place. The cables don't really wiggle around that much. You can kind of focus the antenna where it's more convenient for you. So with this, we would basically put it in a laptop sleeve. So in like larger environments like, like Chicago, um, if we needed to try to steal somebody's card contents on the street, it was easier to walk around and kind of swing that and you could kind of walk by them and kind of flip that out really quick. Um, but the read range on it is very small, like, like this. Trying to get that close to somebody's card, depending on where that's hanging, is extremely awkward. I don't care if you're a female or not, it's just weird. So recently they've come up with some, some better designs uh, to really kind of give us some range so that there's no more awkward conversations on the train as I try to scoot too close to somebody. Uh, so they've weaponized some long range readers, which is really cool. So they basically take in uh, readers that belong in parking garages. So they have a larger read range because they're a larger reader. Uh, and they, actually I have some slides for that. Okay, so they've weaponized these. And basically what they're doing is they're gonna read the Wiegand output on the back side, where we had talked about that, how that's on the copper on the back side. So they just made a big reader to do that with. Um, the read range is really good. A consistent two feet, sometimes three, depending on the environment that you're in and how much metal is around. And it will store hundreds of cards. The Proxmark, like, you can only store, like, two, maybe, um, before it had to, to recycle. And it's, it's non-volatile, so if it lost power, you lost everything. So the long-range reader kind of really solved a lot of those. Um, they're kind of expensive, though. The, the reader itself can be between four and five hundred dollars. Uh, the rest of the equipment is fairly inexpensive. So design one, uh, this was Bishop Fox's design from a handful of years ago. Uh, he's got all of the stuff up on their website if you want to pull the plans down, have your own board cut. Um, it's really not a terribly lengthy process. Um, so he put a display up there so that it shows you the, the card information as well, and then it writes everything to that micro SD. So instead of trying to get so close to somebody that I get card contents and then push another button to play it later. Um, now I can just walk around at lunchtime or in the morning and then go back to my car or the hotel or wherever we are, pull out that micro SD and then just load it up and look at the card data that I have. And then you can kind of draw conclusions based on the facility codes and the card numbers that you're seeing the most of. That, you know, this is probably for the building that I was closest to at that time. Um, this picture of what it looks like on the inside. Uh, those AA batteries do not last very long at all. So that was kind of one of the big challenges with it was hauling all those batteries around and, and trying to keep it in power. That's what the text file looks like, very useful. Um, but it didn't keep power for very long. So the, um, I don't remember the folks that, that deployed this, but uh, it's called Ravenhead. Uh, their stuff is up on GitHub. You can pull down their code. Uh, they use uh, the new Arduinos and a lot of um, a lot of pre-built stuff, right? So the the Adafruit stuff. So you can go to Micro Center and get most of what you need to make this device um, instead of having to order it online. And it does the same basic operation, except for it's much smaller. Um, and the little red thing there is actually a Bluetooth module. I haven't added mine yet because I'm lazy. I just haven't soldered it all together. Uh, that Bluetooth module can sync with your phone and you can put your phone on vibrate so that you know when you're getting card reads. So as it gets a card read, it will write it to the micro SD and then it'll send that data to your phone. So, and, and that's very useful for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, it timestamps it because when you're just walking around, you know, you kind of get close to somebody, but then you get close to a whole bunch of somebody's. So, you know, if I got close to the security guard about one o'clock, I really kind of want to focus on those card reads to see if I got a good one in that area that looks like it's going to match the formats of the cards that I have. So the time stamping on that helps. And having it sync to your phone really lets you know if it's working or not. Otherwise, you just walk around and hope that it works and get back to your car and 
realized that you know the micro SD popped out or something and it wasn't working. So it, it saves you a lot of time. Um, some of the other readers, like this one, is a, a low frequency reader, so there's a lot there's a lot of space in there. Some of the high frequencies, like you can get an iClass reader or an Indala, um, they don't have any space inside of them for you to put your stuff. So I basically just took like a, uh, a project box, uh, I think I got it at Fry's, um, and just kind of mounted that in there so that I can just plug it into whatever reader I need to use at that time, because not all of our clients use the same technology. So it's very cool stuff. If you're interested, there's a GitHub page. Uh, there's where you get the, uh, the Bluetooth add-on. You don't have to write it down. I'm going to post them. Um, power for this, though. Like, I don't know if you noticed on the photo, it uses a different power source. Um, the power banks have really come a long way. So now I don't have to carry a whole bunch of batteries with me anymore. I just invested in a nice power bank. Um, it has to have a 12 volt output. That's like the only drawback. Um, but it lasts several hours. Like we're close to six, six, seven hours, which is more than enough time for you to get what you need. Um, so if you're going to get one, just make sure it has a switch for a 12 volt output. And you can let me know if you have questions. I've, I've made a couple of the different models now. So, Remote attacks, technical, very, woo, you know, it's very impressive. Um, back to physical security kind of being behind us uh, with security through obscurity and things like that. Um, on the back of your cards, don't look now, you can look later. Um, most of the time, the card number is printed on the back of the card. So at first, it kind of takes some convincing to, to really get them to understand that this is an issue. So when the IT people come in, they're like, well, what's the big deal? I said, okay, well, this is the equivalent of taking a Sharpie and writing your password to your laptop on your laptop and carrying it around everywhere and never changing it because you can't. Um, because we only need those two pieces of information to make our own cards, facility code and the card number, um, walking around with, you know, card numbers floating everywhere gives us a really, really big head start. The other problem is uh, they, all, they also print them on the box that the cards come in. Uh, so there's some great social engineering opportunities here. Uh, if you want to call them up, impersonating their vendor um, to try to get the last range of the card that they have. Uh, it tells the, the card format, uh, the range that they have, the facility code, who they ordered it from. Um, and usually these sit like in stacks at the, the ID station. So if you get the right person on the phone, you can get them to read you that information and you don't even have to go out and be creepy with the badge reader. It's very convenient for red teams when we have to travel. Let's look at some of the reader attacks. This stuff is a little bit different. Um, it's starting to gain more popularity. Uh, we're, we're back to, to Weekend output again on the backside. And the, the little bleak key basically goes in line um, with those wires. So if you walk up to one of those readers and you pull it back from the wall, the copper wires are exposed unless they're potted properly, which I haven't seen anybody who pro fully pots all of their wires on their readers. Um, so you basically just clip it to the three wires there. Uh, I think it's power ground and data one. And it sits in line, so it's like man in the middle for the card reader. And it's Bluetooth, so it syncs to your phone. So as long as you're like close enough to that reader, it'll send you the card data, and you can send it commands from your phone. So if I watch somebody swipe a card and enter through the door, I can just tell it to replay that last card read, and it'll let me through the door without a card at all. Um, so. Good stuff. Uh, it also saves everything to micro SD as well. So if I don't, if I can't really hang out by that reader without getting caught, um, I can install it, leave it, and come back for it the next day. Because it gets its power from the reader, uh, it's very small. Um, the guy who made it's Canadian, which is why there's the the Canadian coin to compare it to. Uh, but it's it's small. It installs very quickly. Um, you can be in and out and have it installed in less than a minute. So um, readers fully potting is very important. Uh, more information here. I'm going to put the slides up so that you guys can grab them so you don't have to worry about writing down all the links. If we want to go a little bit low tech, um, we'll go back to request to exit devices. Some of these are really sophisticated and some are not. 
Uh, that little white box at the top there is a motion detector. So this means when you approach that door to leave, it will sense your motion and then unlock the door so that you can push the door open to leave without having to push a button or uh, having to scan your, your credential again to get the door to open. They're convenient. They're used in a lot of places. Um, but they're vulnerable to some like really basic attacks. So if we look at this door here, these doors tell us uh, a couple of things. Uh, one of which, we can see that it's a magnetic lock from those two little buttons there at the top. Those are the screws that are holding the magnets that will hold the door. Um, and that's what we need to get to release because there's a lot of pressure on those magnets. You're not going to force it open. Uh, there's also a very large gap between those doors and underneath of those doors. So we use a really sophisticated device um, to open the door from the outside through that crack. You can get it from the dry cleaners. I like to use this one because it says we love our customers. Uh, you basically unfold it and you make yourself a little flag and you slide the, the flag either between the doors or under. Between is better because you can get closer to the motion sensor. Um, and you just wave your little flag around and the motion sensor senses motion so it unlocks the door. So then you don't even really need cards or Bluetooth apps or anything to get inside of the door. I hope my video works. I didn't have time to test it. So if you do this properly, it only takes a few seconds, like a few seconds. So that's very cool. Um, they've come up with a couple of ways to kind of combat that. The easiest way is to just put some metal stripping between the doors and underneath. Uh, some places choose not to do that for various reasons. Uh, so they adjust the reed beam so that it's not so close to the door, so that it's further out. Uh, which has its own challenges. Uh, a, you know, people that are just walking around in the building in that room can trip that motion sensor just by not being close to the door because the beam is away from the door. Uh, second of which, the coat hanger doesn't work, but the balloons will. So you get the really big clown balloons and you slide it between the door. If you have kids, you probably have one of those hand pumps for the balloons for the kids' birthday parties. Um, it's very portable. Just put the balloon in between, you just pump it up till it's just about ready to bust and you let go of it. So the balloon goes like this and then the motion sensor unlocks the door. It's fantastic. It's very low tech. Um, it's only awkward when it, it doesn't work and you try it a couple of times and then there's a pile of balloons on the inside of the door that you can't get to. So that takes a little explaining the next day. Sliding doors. They're useful, but they're not always the best. Um, we had a client that was, that was very proud of these doors that they put into their um, pre-deployment data center. Um, and it was cool, you know, you'd swipe your card and then it would automatically open, and then when they wanted to exit, they'd swipe the card and it would automatically close. So that if they were pushing a server card or something, they didn't have to worry about holding the door open and trying to balance everything. Uh, but because that door has to fro flow freely, for fire code, if there's a fire, um, you can just kind of let yourself in without badge. So um, they were a little upset about that feature. So we did work with them to get to get something a little bit better implemented in that, so where they could still meet their fire code, but not just walk up and blow the door open. Um, if their system is configured properly, this would deploy an alarm on the physical access system, um, but it's, it's not like network monitoring. They get hundreds of alarms and most of the time nobody pays attention. So just because it sets off an alarm does not mean that somebody is actually going to acknowledge the alarm and go see what's happening. Control panels. Control panels are my favorite um, because they're just those little computers, just little single boards. They're always forgotten, but they're really the brains of this entire operation. Um, and they have a ton of useful data. Remember, it has to have all of the access list cached on it because if it loses connection to the server and it can't update for a while, or if they have a power outage, uh, that controller has a battery backup in it so you can still open the doors and things and people can get in and out of, in and out of the building to work on the power outage. Um, so it's gotta keep all that data local and that's great because we want that data. Um, as red team members, we want that data so that we can make all of our own cards. 
They haven't really quite figured out that these needed lockdown yet from the vendor side. So until that happens, we need to compensate for that on the client side. Um, a lot of them have embedded web servers that just you go to them and it drops you into the admin console um, or the diagnostic utility that's just full of information that we can use to make our own cards. Usually they run FTP, uh, anonymous FTP, so that they can send their backup data back and forth. Uh, and a lot of uh, public-private SNMP strings on these devices. So once you start like scanning some of the, the internal networks, you might start to see them pop up. Um, but it, unless you know like really what you're looking at, it, like, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, they're very fragile, though. So when you do find them, um, do not do a 65K port scan on them because they, they don't handle that very well. Uh, it doesn't even, I don't even think it has a full TCP IP stack. Um, <clears throat> so it does some basic stuff, but it cannot handle a heavy load. And a lot of times these devices will get excluded if the company does like monthly vulnerability scans because it causes problems. So then they're even forgotten even more because they're not included in the monthly scanning. Um, a lot of those web diagnostic utilities only work with Internet Explorer. So if you're using Firefox or something else like I usually am and you hit one of these web servers, you know it's there, but you don't see anything, flip over to you know, your Windows VM or whatever and check it out in Internet Explorer. Um, switching the agent, like if you're using like Burp or something, doesn't, it, just, it doesn't work. So these are some of the common port numbers that I see and uh, some of the keywords. So if you're just reviewing somebody else's vulnerability scans, like their monthly scans, um, it's easier to, to find some of the keywords and some of the informational findings, um, like the Ethernet card manufacturer. A lot of times uh, you'll see Tyco in there, which is one of the big manufacturers. Um, Matrix, iStar, Linnell, uh, really good keywords for access control panels. What can they tell us? Um, a whole lot of stuff. Because it has everything cached already, we just have to figure out how to get to it. Um, they're very chatty, kind of like children, once you get access to one. Because it says, hey, I'm Bobby, and here's all of my friends and how to find them. So it'll tell you all about its path to the database that it talks to. Uh, it'll tell you about its clustering information. Hey, I'm the master controller, and these are all of the controllers that, that report to me. So if, if for some reason some kind of configuration gets changed, they call to that master controller instead of all the way back. Um, so we can really, if we wanted to cause damage, you can really start to poison that cache um, by putting in irrelevant data and letting it propagate throughout. Um, I don't want to do that because I want to open doors. I don't want to lock everything out. Um, some of the databases, you can literally just click and browse them, which is very useful. Uh, so it tells you the, the personnel ID and the card number and the group that they belong to and the access control system and all the stuff that they've touched. Like it's literally just a full log um, for a couple of reasons, you know, forensic reasons one, um, safety reasons for another. They're supposed to be able to account for the people that are in the building at the time. Um, so it'll just tell you all of this if you connect to it with a browser kind of a problem. Uh, Vertex is a tool that goes out and actually hunts a specific brand. Uh, it hunts HIDs, door controllers. Um, I don't see a lot of HIDs, door controllers in large enterprise environments. I usually see them in, in smaller ones. I know, we're, we're running behind. Sorry, guys. Um, OK, the servers themselves, these guys are kind of hard to find because they're usually just like a Windows 2012 server that's just you know included in that server block. Um, sometimes they're named for the software that they use. So if I want to find the access control server, sometimes I can just end this lookup for Secure 9000 or PAX or physical access because that's what they, that's what they name their server. Um, so we, we got to be careful with, with how we do keywords and DNS naming with some of these servers. Some keywords here for you. Um, put the slides up so you can grab them later. Sometimes we can find them without actually having to hit the internal network. So Shodan will also index a lot of physical access system interfaces. So a lot of these keywords that I gave you, you can kind of search Shodan to, just to see what's out there. Uh, a lot of other places that we can find stuff like card numbers and facility codes are on the internal network with SharePoint. Usually they have um, 
almost like a remedy, like a ticketing system, where they keep their log of, you know, I destroyed badge number, whatever, and I reissued this to this person. Um, so I may not even need to gain access to the actual physical access server to get valid card numbers. Okay, almost done. Only a little bit over. So in a recent engagement, um, we had a client that was running uh, iClass, they're encrypted, uh, with their, their standard key. And they're, they're kind of a hard target. They do a lot of patrols, they pay attention. Um, they knew that we were coming and, and they were ready and they weren't gonna lose. Uh, so that added some, some challenge to it in itself. So basically we walked around with our long range iClass reader in the bag around the campus. They had some areas where some of the, the public could get to. So it's very easy to just kind of stroll in and get close to some of the, the employees of the company. Uh, took it back to the hotel, made a whole bunch of cards because you don't know what's gonna work where, so you just, I usually make a whole stack and hope that one of them will work. Um, watch the guards to figure out like where they were at what point of the day. Um, we bought our own card printer. You can buy your own card printer too from eBay uh, at a highly discounted rate. So, you know, a little, a couple photos online, a couple photos in person. Like I'd come up with a pretty good mock-up of their ID card. So you could print it from the, this, this is actually a model better than the printer they used. So when they did start to examine the fake IDs that we made, they couldn't tell that they were fake because they looked identical to the ones that they had. So we watched the guards. We noticed that everybody left at like four o'clock on this one station and it left the guard station open. Um, and the, the tower was just sitting on the floor. So we went a little old school. We put some hardware key loggers on there and um, let it sit all day. Came back the next night after everybody had left, pulled it off, pulled off all their credentials. So you get their domain credentials while, you know, while you're at it. Um, and their credentials to Secure, which is their access control system and a whole bunch of other good stuff too. Uh, so we made duplicate cards for like the really good employees. Um, had access to the server, but you know, you needed internal network access for it, but that was okay because they had a wireless network. And because we had domain credentials, we could get onto the wireless network from the parking lot and look at the physical access server. For reasons that I don't quite understand, um, the folks that make Secure decided to make a mobile client as well. Um, so, you know, when the, the guard opens the turnstile to let a visitor in, you know, they can, they can press buttons to temporarily unlock doors at will. Uh, they decided to, to put that in a mobile app so that you could do that from your phone, which is very convenient for the folks who have to administer it, like the guards, but it's also very convenient for me. So from the parking lot on their wireless network, we were able to just unlock whatever door we wanted at any given time. So really, we could just have walked somebody completely through the building uh, without a card at all at that point. So they weren't happy. Um, they had a lot of good controls, but it wasn't quite put together properly. So I'm working on some ways to really help kind of to bridge this gap between physical access folks and, and IT security folks. Um, common language is gonna be one of our biggest barriers, I think. Uh, working on a checklist for all these little things that we just talked about um, to, to kind of keep in your environment. If you're, if you're an auditor, if you're doing an audit of that system, you know, if you're doing an internal vulnerability assessment, if you're in risk, um, you know, if you're in physical security. And you know, it's, it's gonna take, takes a village. Um, it's gonna take a village. It's gonna take help from the network folks. It's gonna take help from the IT security folks working with the physical folks to really get the system locked down properly. So uh, that's in draft. It's almost ready for release. So once that is ready, uh, we'll have it up on the website. It's free. Um, we can answer questions about it. We can come in and help you with it. Sometimes uh, it works very well uh, when we come in to assess the system because it gives everybody somebody in common to be mad at. Because it creates tension if the, the IT folks tell the physical security folks that their system is busted and it, it sucks and we have to fix it. So if they're all mad at me, then they'll work together better. Um, I'm over my time, so I'm gonna get out of the way. Uh, I hope this was exciting enough, a substitute for BYOD. Uh, I will do questions probably out here so that we don't interrupt the next uh, presentation.
So thank you very much and enjoy the conference.